Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you're all fine and safe. Thank you for um, virtually attending the World Satellite Business Week, and welcome to the session uh, on satellite manufacturers. Um, we had a great and busy afternoon uh, with two great sessions uh, already, uh, many great sessions, but especially two previous sessions with satellite operators and all service providers just earlier. So we are completing now the picture with this final session for today with the top executives of global satellite manufacturers. I'm very pleased to welcome on this virtual stage uh, Lisa Callahan from Lockheed Martin. Hello, Lisa. Uh, Chris Jansen from uh, Boeing. Hi, Chris. Ja Dan Janblonski from Maxar. Hi, Dan. Uh, Hervé Doré from Thales in Space. Bonjour, Hervé. And Jean-Marc Nas from Airbus Defense and Space. Bonjour, Jean-Marc. During our last panel last year, uh, when we all met in Paris in this um, quite different world, um, we discussed the changes in the satellite industry, its profound transformations, and how this was impacting industry players. Obviously, no one could have imagined the world um, uh, and the year that we've been going through and the unprecedented sanitary economic and social crisis induced by COVID-19. The space industry has been experiencing now for um, some years radical uh, market swings, technology shifts, uh, which is creating for sure um, uh, market opportunities uh, for uh, market payers, but also some kind of instable market environment uh, for many of them. So COVID-19 adds further turbulences in this global context. And this is an unusual uh, year in so many ways. And we are very much pleased to uh, uh, welcome the five of you uh, with us today on this virtual stage, sharing your vision about these particular times of our industry. Some logistics about the panel. Um, the panel will be about a discussion session around uh, a number of questions. For you in the audience, uh, you have the possibility to ask questions directly through the platform as you have been doing all uh, this afternoon. Please continue to do so and I'll make sure to uh, relate some of your questions and uh, we'll try as well to save some time at the end of the session for a Q&A with you. Last point, during the discussion, we'll have a agree-disagree break session. Uh, in the audience, you have the possibility uh, to vote for each of these questions, and uh, we will compare your answers with those of our speakers. So stay ready for this. Uh, we'll try to have an interactive uh, session there. So I propose that we start, um, and I'd like to start the discussion uh, which is not so much surprising and original, uh, but how the current COVID crisis has impacted uh, your business um, and how you see this uh, with respect to the industry more generally. So um, my first question will be just simply and straight, how um, have you adapted your business operations since the start of the pandemic? How strong was this impact? And what kind of concrete example maybe you can share with us? Uh, and maybe if we can start uh, ladies first with uh, Lisa. Great, thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me, really appreciate it. Um, so obviously these have been pretty unprecedented times that we've been in. Uh, I would say um, fortunate for our business, uh, we had continuity plans, business continuity plans in place. And so we were ready, not necessarily for this type of pandemic, but for this type of operation. So, we had two real focus areas when um, in March when this really hit us in the United States, and that was around keeping our employees safe and then keeping our commitments to our customers and making sure we had their, their backs and what we were doing. So a number of our employees um, were teleworking at that point, and the folks that we had in our facilities were really those that were touching hardware or those that were working our classified programs that needed to be in. So we spent a ton more money on cleaning and making sure our facilities were safe for our employees. Uh, and then those folks that were working from home were able to do so seamlessly because of the infrastructure we already had in place. Um, as far as our customers are concerned, we kept our business operations going and have, um, I'm proud to say that the team has really been able to keep our critical paths for our customers on track. Uh, we have completed um, TVAC testing. We've come, uh, we've actually launched satellites for our military customers. AHF-6 was launched as well as our GPSs during this pandemic. So we've continued to move forward and then lastly, I'm really proud of the team. We've really not experienced any employee-to-employee -employee transmission of the virus either. So 
um, mm -hmm. the, the efforts and the money we're spending in our facilities is paying off. Uh, who wants to continue on this? Uh, maybe Jean-Marc, do you want to give your um, uh, share how you have been adapted in the last two months? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me uh, on this panel. Uh, clearly, uh, yes, in line with what Lisa was saying, we, uh, this was not uh, foreseen in our industry and we had to manage. Um, taking care of our employees has been our first uh, first goal and we, we've been doing that uh, at the beginning to ensure that everything is, everything is safe and it was the case. But we had to reinvent a bit with the way we are doing things. Uh, the, this disruption of travel in, uh, has impacted us in Europe more maybe than in the US as we could not uh, cross the borders inside Europe and we had to, and, and our supplies are mainly done uh, with European corporations. So we had to find ways to overcome this uh, definitely, but also to learn how to work with our customers. And uh, uh, actually it's uh, kind of a paradoxical, but we've been signing many contracts this year, although it's uh, very special year, but we've been signing many commercial contracts remotely uh, on DocuSign, uh, being a video call with our customers and this uh, very close relationship with our customers through this, throughout this pandemic has been a, a real gift for us at Airbus. So we are very pleased to see that. And actually it's uh, difficult to say that, but it's, it's, it's a disaster for, for what the pandemic is, but for the business at the moment with our governmental customers and our uh, overseas customers, it's probably one of the best years that we've been having so far. So it's a, it's a very paradoxical situation for us. Mm. Dan, Dan, maybe to continue on this, is it impacting the overall capability level uh, at your company or is it running, you know, uh, you adapted and basically know you're running as before or does it have an impact on your production capability? Uh, for the most part, we've been able to, to handle the, all of the production capacity uh, throughout the pandemic. I think what we saw though, uh, when, when the first shutdowns happened, that there was a bit of a lag in the supply chain, a little bit of a lag and everyone getting used to the the new mode of operations. So more social distancing, uh, wearing masks and other per, uh, personal protective equipment in the facilities. Something's taking just a little bit longer to start with, but I think we've figured out for the most part how to operate in that environment, uh, to how to keep supporting launches. We've launched one satellite during the pandemic uh, down out of French Guiana. Uh, we've shipped another satellite that's preparing for launch out of Cape Canaveral. Uh, we've, we've, for the most part, been able to keep uh, operations going. And I think uh, across the world, that's in large part to the support of governments uh, designating, designating our capabilities as critical infrastructure along the way. Uh, so they've been very helpful, uh, especially in the U.S., but we've seen it in other jurisdictions as well. And I think that's been very helpful. Uh, the teams have taken everything very seriously, but have continued to, to power through and to support our customers, which has been a very important aspect of um, working through the pandemic. We're looking forward to being on the other side of this, but until that happens, uh, we're, we're able to support our critical ne uh, customer needs and missions. Chris, maybe um, any uh, significant impact on the uh, production capability or not so much? No, I mean, in a, a similar way that, you know, others have said that we've, you know, fortunate that we've got processes in place, you know, working on satellites is often a, you know, it's, it's very clean, kind of environment anyway. So I think that certainly there were more processes and social distancing and, and whatnot. But, you know, in a lot of cases, when we work production, we've got masks on anyway to do to do things. So I think, you know, we were fortunate to, to keep production up and going. Certainly there's been some, you know, some challenges with the supply base, but, you know, we continue to push forward, uh, you know, to meet the commitments just to, you know, as others have said, uh, you know, from kind of my team, and I think probably others had, the, had a similar um, approach you know, it certainly took a couple of weeks when the majority of my folks were virtual, you know, on the engineering side. So thankfully that the production continued, but um, I really think that we found a groove um, kind of, of, of how we can interact in a virtual sense. And, and it's a lot of things that, that I think people didn't believe we could do until we were forced to do it. Similar to how we're all here today. Mm -hmm. It's like this, this would have, you know, seemed kind of crazy for us to all be on a video call like this scattered around the world. But, you know, we've, figured out a good rhythm, not only with our internal team, but with our customers. And so similar to um, what John Mark was saying is that, you know, it's amazing what you can get done on video call and and what might get done for me waking up in the morning and, and a good customer at SES just, uh, you know, wrapping up for the day that, that you just kind of figure out a new rhythm. It's it's amazing how adaptable we are. So, um, yeah, we're, we're full steam ahead and, and excited about it. For some of you, uh, has the situation um, accelerated some 
internal transformations, investments in some uh, uh, innovation areas? Uh, um, uh, did you make some decisions with the pandemic that is actually positive in the long term in terms of how you are actually organizing yourself or with respect to the facilities or the production? Uh, Hervé, for instance, uh, do you want to? Yeah, I this. think uh, I think it has changed. We, we had to be creative in a way because uh, the conditions for working were not the same anymore. So uh, indeed, uh, we we looked at what uh, digital uh, tools could provide in order to uh, to get us uh, effective in that uh, in that situation. Uh, this applied to all works. This applied to all activities, uh, starting with the sales activities on on one side, where we had uh, obviously not the capability to travel anymore. So uh, we had indeed to interact remotely with our customers, but also to equip local teams uh, that are in country facing customers with, uh, let's say, digital tools in order to promote uh, our offerings. Mm. Uh, we saw that also in the engineering teams, because engineering teams usually like to gather together. They have their Obeya rooms, as you know. So we had mm. to invent uh, e-Obeya uh, approach in order for, for uh, let's say, collaboration to, to be maintained, despite mm. the fact that people were working from home. Uh, and finally, one of the most interesting uh, innovation uh, we, we found was, um, I have an example of uh, a payload that we had to ship to uh, Siberia for integration. And uh, normally the teams were supposed to, let's say, travel on site in order to do, uh, let's say, the, um, the uh, local, uh, local uh, mechanical integration and the commissioning of the payload. This was obviously not possible. And the team had the idea to apply uh, the remote surgery, surgery techniques and tools in order mm -hmm. to basically do exactly what they would have done on site uh, using those, uh, those uh, processes and tools. And at the end of the day, it worked perfectly. Uh, the integration has been a success and the customer was, was very happy. Any one of you uh, may want to, uh, to share some uh, innovations or investments decisions that you may have taken, if any, um, with respect to uh, transform transformation, digitalization of factories or whatever, an acceleration. Was the COVID somehow an accelerator in terms of some investment decision? Yes, Jean-Marc. <laughs> yes, in fact, uh, COVID did not um, create digitalization in Airbus. We started the digitalization program three years back, and I've never been so happy of having done that in the past because having a, a digital mockup for our satellites from the design to manufacturing and services has revealed to be an absolute key asset for us to navigate throughout the pandemic. So I think it's, it's, uh, it was the right decision, and uh, it shows that we can do many things, exactly what Hervé said, uh, you know, uh, doing... Uh, doing uh, technical moves uh, thousands of kilometers away from your home base. You can do this today. And I think certifying those tools, making sure they are cyber safe and they can allow us to develop is really the, the breakthrough. So it's something we will continue to develop further. Yes, Lisa? Hi, I'll, uh, I think Jean-Marc said it well. I think um, we've all been working on digital transformation tools. I know for us at Lockheed, um, what that's enabled us to do is really accelerate things that we were rolling out in kind of a prototyping fashion in some ways and on certain programs. Now we're doing it more broadly across our entire business. I think one great example that we had that happened during the pandemic is our OSIRIS-REx spacecraft, which was orbiting around Bennu, had to go through and do a, a, a tag of the asteroid. Um, and we did an entire, the first rehearsal remotely because we couldn't have folks in the office. So they were doing it from all over. So it's enabled us to do a lot of this collaboration that we were doing in part, but now accelerating that, and it's been uh, a great success for us. Okay. And while interfacing with our customers and, and allowing them into our factories without them actually having to be there in person. I think, uh, Chris, you mentioned uh, the supply chain. Um, are you concerned um, about the sustainability of your supply chain or some of the suppliers, some critical capabilities. There was some discussion over the summer, I remember, about this. I don't know today if it's still true or if things have improved. Um, maybe, Chris, do you want to elaborate on this uh, first? Or um... Yeah, I mean, I mean, certainly it's something that as a business we have to keep, you know, very focused eye on to, to ensure that the supply base is healthy. Um, you know, whether that's COVID-driven, whether that's business-related, um, you know, it, in order for us to meet our commitments to our customers, in order for us to, to continue to invest and, and bring new capabilities to the market, we need a, a strong and healthy supply base. 
So I don't think that that has changed during the, the COVID pandemic, like our focus on making sure that our suppliers are healthy and, and, and bring in quality products to the market. I'd say, you know, the, the types of questions and the kinds of things that we're engaged with our suppliers on certainly have. Um, you know, you, you see different places of the world have, you know, different conditions at, at various times, and you just have to work through it, just like you would if there was a, you know, other kind of technical issue. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's constantly a focus. I don't think it's it's any different than it has been. Um, but okay. you know we're we're engaged on a you know daily weekly basis with with key suppliers in order to to meet our commitments because at the end of the day that's really what it's about for our customers. Jean-Marc Hervé on the supply chain in Europe, any specific concerns with respect to the following the pandemic? Maybe well, we we've been following our critical suppliers on on a regular basis. So uh, I mean I, I concur with what Chris said before. Uh, no uh, no real change there. I mean it's uh, our duty to to monitor them and make sure they are they are healthy and, and able to uh, basically to go through uh, the different uh, events uh, of the market. Uh, so we we didn't really um, have major issues with our supply chain. Obviously, they have been impacted during the uh, lockdown period for, for a short while, uh, but they resumed activity mm -hmm. fairly quickly. Um, I think one of the other elements that really helped also was that our uh, institutional uh, customers, uh, especially, uh, let's say, the uh, national agencies, uh, but also the uh, European Space Agency, has very well supported us during uh, the crisis making sure that uh, we, uh, let's say, we have a, a cash support uh, on time so that we could support our, our critical suppliers, which we did. Uh, and uh, I think it helped some of them to, uh, to go through the, uh, the most difficult period of time. But all in all, I, I, we didn't really experience uh, huge uh, or specific issues with our supply chain at this stage. Okay. To complete what Zerbe is saying, uh, I think um, what we see here uh, in, in Europe is that the tier three suppliers, the very small ones, small uh, and medium enterprises, but the small ones, some of them are suppliers to our tier one suppliers. So they are uh, not very close to us and some of them are suffering. And uh, we have set up a watchtower to look at them and monitor what's happening. Because some of them, we're not there saying they have a problem and they have a problem. And some of them are doing very specific things that are absolutely key for satellites. So I think we have set up in France at least a watchtower at the national level to follow those small small companies that can have problems and will not uh, you know, use the tools or be able to raise their voice at the right time. So we, we do that. And actually there are a couple of them that are really suffering at the moment and we, we look at them and there is also a plan at national level to invest in those companies to keep them afloat if necessary. Maybe one last question on this uh, on this uh, pandemic uh, situation, and, and then after we move to other subjects. Um, obviously, this has uh, we've seen uh, a lot of consequences and uh, impact uh, throughout uh, the space industry uh, over the since uh, uh, last spring. Um, whether some uh, company failures, or, um, uh, revenue losses, and, and and staff reduction measures, and so on. Um, What's your perspectives? Do you consider that the worst is behind us or ahead of us? Um, Dan, maybe let's start. Let's start with you. Do you think that things we've 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 gone through the uh, the worst the worst part of it? Well, I think it's it's hitting different parts of the, the industry in different ways. Uh, obviously, we had the uh, the one way bankruptcy, which um, I think was not a COVID uh, induced event. It was it was more of a business model. And, but uh, now that now that they're restructuring and they're on back into operations and those sorts of things, I think that um, I, you know as a whole, I think the the resiliency of the industry is being is being borne out. The critical nature of what we do in space uh, is being more apparent, becoming more apparent to our customers, both on the government side as well as on the telecommunications and infrastructure side. And I think it's been a you know in, in many ways a, a reaffirmation. Of the promise and the capabilities that we are, were able to bring with space-based assets, so I, I'm not sure if we're, we're through all of the worst of it in all of the pockets. But as a broad, as a broad, uh, in a broad fashion, I think that, that it's it's very clear that we're in a growing industry, and there's an awful lot of excitement about about what it is. Really. Who want to continue on this? Um, or Lisa, maybe. What's your opinion? <laughs> I would uh, I would agree with Dan. I, I think we're um, we're still in sort of an up and down cycle as we're seeing um, you know COVID spike across the United States and then in Europe again. Um, I, I would say from an industry perspective, as many have already commented on, 
I think we've gotten through what it takes to continue to move our business forward, and um, and there's no um, issues from that perspective. But as far as the industry itself, I think you're still going to see um, some uh, businesses continue to suffer, particularly those in the mobility. Uh, until the air, you know airplane industry starts to crank back up again and tourism starts again, so um, I think there's there's still that in front of us as well. But I would agree with Dan. I think we're a resilient industry, and uh, I know from our business perspective, the diversity in our portfolio has enabled us to weather storms in one area and continue to move forward in others. So. Um, Chris, maybe do you want to comment on this? What's your what's your perspective? Uh, yeah, I mean, certainly hopeful. We're at the, uh, you know, on, on the uh, the downhill side of this particular pandemic, but, um, you know, I, I think there's still a lot of work, a lot of work ahead of us. And I think the way that we've positioned from a business continuity perspective, from, you know, finding out and figuring out a, a way to work given the current state, that I, I'm feeling positive from a business perspective and, and hopeful from a, we can get back and, and be in Paris all together on stage next year um, <laughs> perspective for, for, for all of us. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, making sure that we have the resilience as a business. And I think that our industry has shown that even if certain demand goes down, I mean, I know my, my three kids are all at school at home and, and the demands on my internet and, and, and the connectivity is even more pronounced today than it, it was before. So I think the kinds of conversations that we're having with customers and, and the kinds of conversations that we're having with various, you know, governments and, and whatnot is what well, we need to have resilient and communications. And, and for our business, that's a great that's a great situation for us to be in. And those kinds of capabilities need to be reactive and adaptable to the kinds of changing things that you know. Who would have thought that this would have been a, you know a drive to where my my internet connectivity went up four or five x in the past few months. And, and I think you're seeing that in a number of other places. So I think we'll continue to push the technology. We'll, we'll continue to provide capabilities, but but I, I'm hopeful that the that the, the worst is behind us and, and we can move forward. Any last uh, uh, comment on this while we move to the next question? Jean-Marc, Yes, uh, maybe one, one uh, you, you asked mm -hmm. for is it behind us or away, <laughs> ahead of us. I think mm -hmm. COVID-19 is probably the worst of COVID-19 is probably behind us now because we know how to manage and we'll get out of this. You've seen the vaccine announcement this morning. By the way, the share price of Airbus went up 20% after this announcement. So there is a, a strong action. So yeah. I think this is probably mm -hmm. going to be behind us at some point, but pandemics are not behind us. We are living in this world of pandemic going forward and we have to adapt. I think it's probably normal time uh, to the what, what we have ahead of us and we have to adapt going forward. But exactly as Chris and and Dan said, I think this this, this industry is, is doing something which is absolutely so rain and mandatory for all our customers. It will not stop. We just need to adapt to it and be resilient. Okay, let's move on to uh, to um, more discussions about the uh, commercial market trends. Um, so if we look at the uh, geocomsat market, and if we put aside the FCC CBAN orders, which are quite specific, we have this year four, I would say, regular uh, commercial uh geo orders so far um do you consider the geo market to be in a long structural decline or is it a long low cycle phase i would say one should the first answer on this Alvin? maybe I can, I can i can start on that one first uh, I'm, I'm not totally sure we should make a distinction between the geo market and the rest of the uh, satellite communication market because at the end of the day um, those different, uh, let's say, solutions serve the same market. So this, this, this distinction is a bit artificial, uh, and I would I would look at the market uh, on a, on a global basis. Generally speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, se second comment uh, regarding the uh, the C band and then putting aside C band is not totally fair in in trying to assess the market because at the end of the day, uh, those C band programs they uh, they keep some uh, operators busy. Uh, obviously, uh, mm -hmm. it mobilizes also part of their investment capability. 
Um, and and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, while they do that or while they launch those programs, they can't launch other programs in parallel. Or at least it has it has an impact on their capability to launch other programs. So so putting those uh, those C band uh, let's say uh, uh, satellite programs apart is is a bit uh, also uh, unfair when when trying to uh, to evaluate that uh, the market trend. Uh, the, the market, as we have seen it, was, was quite down in the uh, years 17 and 18. We've seen it, uh, let's say, uh, raising again by, uh, by the end of 2019. It's clear that the COVID uh, had small impact or had probably an impact on, on the rhythm of, of new programs. Uh, but my own personal view on, the, on that market, on, on, even if we focus on the geo market itself, is that uh, I, I, I think this market will uh, will grow again, uh, especially because it provides say, the, the level of, uh, of connectivity we were talking about before. I mean, the, the really serves the need for connectivity that has demonstrated uh, to be extremely uh, strategic and, 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 uh, and mandatory in COVID years. Uh, and also because it has demonstrated that uh, we can keep on innovating, we can keep on innovate in that domain and providing, uh, say, a better and better uh, service with a higher resilience and a higher flexibility. So I think this is um, this is serving the market requirements. Therefore, I believe we should see it growing. Okay, that's clear clear answer. Thank you, Hervé. Um, who wants to give a comment on this? Uh, Dan, for instance, what's your what's your position with respect to the evolution of the geo market? Well, I, I think I would echo a number of the comments that Hervé made, uh, that um, it, we don't think about it as just GEO or just LEO or other orbitologies that are going to be used in the future here, but as a continuum of, of, of how data moves, how communications infrastructure works and other support uh, that will be used in space. And so I think it, it's still a very dynamic environment. Um, I agree I would not uh, categorize the C-band as, as you know, sort of just something that, that is you know, not germane to how our business uh, partners are operating. Uh, it, it provides an awful lot of additional capacity and additional resiliency to constellations. So I think it's it's a good development in and of itself. Um, it's not a completely sustainable development because it's re related to the FCC freeing up the, the C-band spectrum. But on the other hand, uh, the, the long-term trends we're seeing are, are very, very positive and very stable. I think we'll have some ups and downs along the way towards greater stability, but, but in general, we're, we're positive in the way the commercial markets are developing. Jean-Marc, for instance. Yes, yeah, so with my colleagues, I agree that uh, the FCC orders should not be uh, discounted from the commercial market. It is a commercial market. Look, uh, what we see is a very active market so far. We've been booking five satellites, three firms with, with two options in two months of July, August, between the two confinements, the two lockdowns in, in Europe. And, uh, and that's a sign that the market is really active. Uh, uh, having Optus, a new operator in Australia, going for a flexible satellite in July, then having Arabsat going for its eighth uh, satellite, then uh, Turaya with four plus the option number five, is a sign that uh, the market is really active. So it's, uh, it, and it has been done throughout situation where the operators were face facing uh, major disruptions in their own markets on mobility and other things, but the video market is still very, uh, very active. And we see this going, uh, going, going uh, further. So it's a, uh, we are very positive about it. I think the market will continue to rebound, and it, this year will probably be, be one of the best years in terms of orders. Stay tuned on the frequency. More announcement will come before your end on this, and uh, and, uh, and and more and more to come. And as far as the FCC satellites, we, 11 out of 13 satellites are embarking uh, Airbus equipment on board. So we are very pleased that this is a very very valid market. So no, we are very positive about it, and we we look forward to see it increasing again in the future. Chris, Lisa, are you uh, as well very much positive about the market situation in the, let's say, geo and, and non-geo? Yeah, so certainly, you know, the other points that are brought up that I think just focusing on geo just isn't the right kind of metric anymore. And I know we've spent mm -hmm. time on stage talking about that in the past. But, um, you know, for example, the, the O3BM power constellation, you know, we signed additional four satellites in, in MEO for, for SES during the pandemic. And, you know, I think that's you know, a great sign that, that that constellation and the technology we're bringing forward is a, is a real positive real positive aspect. Um, I would say, you know, strictly from a geo perspective, what we've been trying to do, and we've been doing it for a little while, is develop technology that's 
kind of independent of whether it's Geo, Mio, or Leo. So how do we get core building blocks? How do we get the tech such that depending on the customer mission need, and I think that can vary depend, you know, very wildly based on business case and, and, and what folks are, are really trying to do, that, that we're going to have the mission solutions in order to to satisfy, you know, our customers being successful. And so today that's been focused a lot around Mio and the Empower technology for, for flexible satellites. I think, you know, we're seeing a lot of increased interest in geo as folks need to replace those kind of capabilities. Certainly, I believe that, you know, that that probably some of the, the larger deals that, that I was anticipating in 2020 probably have, have slowed slightly. Um, and, and some of that probably was focused based on, on some of the C-band activities and, and just some of the you know, overall softness in the market. But I, I'm still very bullish on, on when you bring the right technology to market that, that satisfies customer business needs, that, that folks will find the investment in order to, to push that forward. And I think we're seeing that in a number, in a number of other areas, right? There's a lot of uh, investment coming into this industry. And so, you know, making sure that we position our customers to have that right business case, um, you'll see a lot more deal flow over the next six to 12 months. Lisa, maybe uh, uh, yeah. you want to complete the picture? Yeah, thanks. So I, I agree with what um, Chris and others have said in terms of the market play. And I think if you go back to even Chris's comments earlier about his bandwidth at home, um, I, I think if nothing else, COVID has really shown what we can do um, via um, you know telework and other things. And I think the demand is just going to increase for data. Um, the one area I would just highlight that others haven't yet is it's not just about satellites, it's also the integration into terrestrial. Um, and we have a satellite now, right, that's um, operating right now for a customer that's integrated into their 4G LTE network. And so the seamless integration between satellite and terrestrial networks is something you'll continue to see evolve and grow, particularly as we get into the 5G world as well. So uh, I think um, it's still very positive um, marketplace and, and um, agree with Chris and the investments that we're making on smart satellites and being able to uh, you know, have software-defined satellites and this integration into the ground systems and terrestrial networks, I think, will, and AI will continue to uh, be a big focus for ours going forward. Well, one quick question following up on the uh, FCC C-band uh, orders. Um, with the uh, 13 satellite orders um, from SES and Intelsat, there is a very short deadline for delivery. Uh, some of you received multiple orders um, to four, uh, five. Um, the, um, so how do you manage this two-year deadline? For, uh, uh, does it, do you have to accommodate uh, other, other customers? Are you confident uh, to, uh, to go through this uh, uh, challenging deadline or, or well, everything is, is, is okay and all right? Dan, maybe, obviously, question to you. Sure, thanks, Steve. Uh, well, we're very confident in the, the timelines uh, that we're working with. Uh, for, we're working with Intelsat as our customer here. Um, we were very proactive working with them ahead of time making sure that the supply chain would support the, the, the timelines that we were looking at, that we had the factory capacity and the right conditions to be able to move forward quickly and uh, have moved seamlessly into the, uh, the design and, and production phase on the satellites. And so we're, we're very confident in the timelines. We're very confident in, in our ability to deliver on the schedules that they need to, to be able to take advantage of the FCC um, priorities here. More generally, do you see, um, uh, uh, I would say, convergence from your customers to have this reduction in terms of delivery time? Uh, is it something that you are continuously seeing, or is that is it related to a more specific customer requirements? I, I'd, I'd say, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of smiling at the rest of the panel here, but I'm sure they're hearing the same thing we are, that mm -hmm. uh, the customers, once they come to us with the business case, really would like to go as fast as they possibly can. They'd like to be as versatile as they can, and they'd like to be quick. And um, and they'd like it to also be economical. So I think all of the investments that are going on across the industry and, and uh, you know, the, the other companies that are represented here as well as ours are really being designed to be able to shorten the timeline uh, for the space programs, for the development work, and for the how quickly you can get on orbit. Uh, it's all about the economics of the business model for our customers. Uh, the faster we can get them there, uh, the, the more quickly they can re, uh, recoup their business plans and, and be able to serve their downstream customers. Any uh, any follow up uh, comments on this on this? Uh... 
time 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 to delivery constraints. Um, I don't know, Jean-Marc, Hervé, any any comment? So clearly, clearly, indeed, I mean, this is a general trend on the market. Uh, to answer your initial question on on uh, uh, let's say the um, our capability to deliver on time for this uh, health and space has been the uh, the only non-US prime selected. Uh, but uh, indeed, here also, enfin, on our side also, we worked uh, with with, uh, with our customer, uh, and this is a pretty standard uh, type of, of of satellite. So, no issue in uh, in managing the delivery time. Okay. Jean-Marc, maybe uh, a general comment with respect to time to time to delivery. Do you expect shorter and shorter requirements? Requests yes, and we've done here. They want cheaper products, faster products, and better products all the time. So it's up to us to keep them uh, quite calm and, and motivated. Uh, we can do many things, but uh, the, the last thing we will do is to uh, is to accelerate in, in, against quality. So it's uh, it's uh, it's definitely uh, the, the trend. Our flexible satellite offer is the answer at the moment for us, and we can deliver twice faster, uh, twice cheaper from a normal geo, and uh, and and it's flexible, so it can be reprogrammed. So I think it's that's the, that's the answer to the question from from Airbus side. But clearly, we we need to, to do more about it, and I I think there will be still um, breaking news coming coming in the in the future on that. There are new technologies, and we we'll speak of it later, that will allow us to do a different thing. So I think it's uh, this race is not over; it will continue. And it's our responsibility to keep doing things uh, in that in that uh, in that field. Yes. I propose that we make a break with this uh, agree disagree session. Fast questions. I'm going to shoot five questions to you in the audience in the audience as well. Normally the poll should be running. I hope that's going to work. So try to keep an eye on the uh, on the computer here to see the uh, the uh, the answers. Um, so my first questions uh, first question will be. Um, uh, first statement, and then you tell me if you agree or disagree. Uh, Geo will become marginal in the global satcom infrastructure. So let's start with Chris. Disagree. I mean, for that, that it's still going to be prime real estate that provides the easiest access to an you know an existing set of customers, and and will enable things that we haven't even thought of into the future. Uh, Dan. Dis disagree as well. I, I, I think that uh, it is uh, an essential component of the continuum of offerings that will be available. I think especially with high throughput capabilities and the, and the power uh, that, that we can demonstrate going forward at, at geo orbits, that the customers will find many use cases for that. And I think it's still going to be an exciting component of the, the overall industrial. Okay. Uh, Lisa? I disagree as well. I think Geo has its strengths, and I think we'll continue to see them in a multi-orbital, um, you know, architecture. Okay. Uh, uh, Jean-Marc, sorry, I tried to see the answers, but I don't see the answers here. So <laughs> that's, disagree uh, as well. Uh, okay. Disagree. Okay. Disagree as well. It's uh, still the best cost uh, gigabit cost and efficiency. So no. no. Okay. Good future. And uh, Hervé. I disagree as well, yes, for, you for disagree. the reasons as well that were said before, yeah. And also because some applications can't go through uh, non-geo satellites, uh, such as broadcast or uh, very high density areas coverage. Okay, so you all disagree. Unfortunately, I don't see the results. So that's uh, too bad. Uh, on my return screen, I don't see. So if somebody in the technical side can uh provide the answers on the um, on the chat for instance but otherwise we'll keep we'll keep moving second question investors will continue to have growing appetite for new space ventures chris despite the context i would say or because of the context yes agree um you know agree. there's a, there is a lot of investment and money and opportunity flowing into this industry and i think that will continue okay uh dan I absolutely agree. Uh, the, the trends will continue. Uh, the use cases will multiply, and there will continue to be money flowing. Lisa, and I also agree. I think um, investors are going to continue to re, uh, invest money where they feel they can get money out, and there's a lot of opportunities in the space domain right now. Um, Jean-Marc. Agree, uh, and uh, just to, sh to show you all the talk, we are investing at the moment in the space ventures, so it's a great. Okay, and Hervé, to conclude? 
agree. Yes, uh, 2019 has been a record year. I don't see why uh, 2020 and the years to come should not be on that trend. Okay, so for Q, question one, actually, most people disagreed. So from what I what I seen as well uh, for that question, so you all agree uh, with the fact that investors will have growing appetite uh, for new space ventures. Uh, third question: Current context will lead to a major industry reorganization. Uh, Chris, same. I got to go first twice. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree, <laughs> and it's just like I was taking a test at school. The word major is the, the reason I'm going to disagree. There are certainly reorganizations and partnerships that will happen because of the changing nature of our business, but, but I'll uh, disagree because of major changes. Okay. Dan? Uh, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm not quite sure. I, I think I disagree and, and agree to, to some extent here. I think that, uh, as Chris said, I don't think we're going to see a major restructuring anytime fast, especially with the amount of uh, growth in, in space investments taking place. But on the other hand, uh, there's a very dynamic marketplace, both on the services side and on the manufacturing side. And on the edges, uh, partnerships will be created, investments will, will be um, put forward, and, and the best use cases will move forward. So, uh, it's a very tough question. Yeah, It's hard to peer into the future exactly. Who knows? Who knows? But uh, you may have some feelings. <laughs> uh, Lisa? I think I disagree as well. Um, I do think you're going to see more industry partnerships and cooperations. I'm just not sure they will result in like mergers and acquisitions and reorganizations at this point. Oh, sorry, I didn't get, you said disagree? Yeah, I disagree. Disagree. Uh, Jean-Marc? I think I disagree that a, a, a major industry innovation will happen, but I agree that many uh, industry innovations will happen. So it's a disagree for a major. But agree for many of them. Okay, and Hervé? Yeah, I, I, I probably also contest the word major, but reorganizations definitely, uh, especially on the service provider side. Uh, there was already uh, say market conditions for some consolidation of that market, uh, and uh, I think uh, the COVID crisis will probably uh, mm. maybe accelerate part of it start seeing some uh, vertical uh, consolidation um, and there might be other consolidations coming up in the uh, uh, medium term uh, future. Hmm. So the answers are coming through post-it here, so it's a uh, very, very modern virtual. Um, but from what I see, uh, actually there is for the first time a disagreement with you because most of the people are actually agreeing on this statement. Uh, but we can see that there were some 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 shared shared uh, feelings on this, on your side too. Um, fourth question: There is no market room uh, beyond two mega comsat constellations. Chris, sorry, you are you on my top of the list each time, so I'll start with you. <laughs> uh, I'll I'll disagree. Um, I think I'll disagree. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll disagree that there's no market room left beyond two. I think. There are a number of interesting business cases, and I think demand um, that could lead to more than two. Mm. And I'll say that's, a, that's about... probably a change in, in what I said on stage the last couple of years, that, that we're seeing a lot of investment and a lot of opportunity. Mm. For mega, when we mean mega, uh, not, com not let's say smaller constellations, but uh, okay. Uh, Dan. And I feel like I'm sitting at the card table next to Chris and get to go after the <laughs> <laughs> I'll disagree as well. I think that the uh, the demand signals we're seeing from the marketplace are still very, very strong. And as use cases continue to adapt to what consumers and downstream users are looking uh, for, that there, there certainly could be more than two. Uh, the economics and the demand drivers will be the, the, the key impacts to that. Lisa? Yeah, I'm going to disagree as well. I think. Um, there's a lot of uh, new technologies coming on board, some of which are not in the space industry that I think could play a role here. And I think if you come in with disruptive technologies, there's always an opportunity for more than one and two. Hmm. Jean-Marc? I disagree as well, uh, not only because we work on more than two constellations today, but uh, also because uh, I think there are governmental constellations and uh, public uh, private constellations, and they will all serve uh, Mixed, mixed, uh, mixed customers, so I think there will be more than two. Okay, and Hervé? 
Yeah, I disagree as well. Uh, I think for the reasons that were said before, technological innovation on one side, but also indeed a part, that there will be some uh, sovereign considerations into, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, have to take, that have to be taken into account uh, and that will uh, probably add on additional uh, considerations for that reason. Mm. So you all uh, disagree with the statement, which is on pure pose controversial. Um, but uh, interestingly, on the audience side, it's a 50-50 answer. So 50% of uh, the audience agree on that with, the, uh, with this statement. Last question uh, for this agree-disagree uh, um, uh, question block. Uh, vertical integration will keep increasing, reducing the open market, uh, the open commercial market for primes. Chris. So I'm going to disagree. I mean, I, I, I think the key here is that for, for primes like us is to continue to add value and add technology differentiation. And, and as long as we keep doing that, um, we'll, we'll continue to have a, an open market that grows. Okay. That's clear. Dan? I think uh, there's two questions there. One is whether vertical integration will continue, and in some customer sets it will. Uh, so I agree with that part of the statement. I'm not sure it will necessarily reduce the accessible commercial market for the clients because in a growing marketplace, there's still continued and growing opportunities that are expansive. So it may, it may take out a part of the market, but I think overall the clients will continue to grow. Hmm. Interesting. Um, let's continue, Lisa. I disagree as well. I think they'll um, continue to be a marketplace for primes in this, and I think particularly as the appetite uh, in the industry and for bandwidth and communications continues to grow, um, the integration with the terrestrial networks will continue. Satellites will still play a role in there, and I think the primes will still have that opportunity. Okay. Uh, Jean-Marc, disagree as well? I disagree as well, but we'll see what happens. Uh, it's uh, still a very recent uh, situation, integration. Vertical integration. Well, I think I disagree because I think uh, our customers still want us to play a major role here, and uh, if a fully integrated uh, supplier is someone that is competing against its own customers. So it's uh, it's something that will not be sustainable in the long run. So I disagree. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, and Hervé, uh, to conclude yeah, I, on this, I disagree as well. I think the, the vertical integration is, is more on the service uh, side, of the business. Uh, I don't see it uh, impacting the prime's business model. Okay, well, that's clear. I don't have the answer from the poll uh, yet, but I guess it will come later. But uh, we'll be interested. Ah, I think it's coming <laughs> on the post -aid. And it's 60% uh, disagree and 40% agree on this statement. So it's uh, maybe more mixed uh, answers uh, as well on the poll, which is not surprising. Uh, let's move on uh, and continue to some more general questions and coming back to uh, the constellations and the NGSO's constellations. Um, the, so SpaceX is uh, moving rapidly uh, forward uh, with the deployment with Starlink. Um, Amazon is making good progress as well with Skyper. Um, no one way, but well is, is back in the game uh, following it, uh, reorganization and the UK government taking over the shares. So we have three NGSOs operating, I would say, in a non-traditional economic model if you are taking into account their shareholders, let's say. Are you, or, um, do you see any major, or not maybe, don't say major, do you see any risk of disruption um, in the SATCOM market uh, and its ecosystem, should these three NGSOs uh, become fully operational? I want to start on this. Um, Jean-Marc. I don't know what you call a non-traditional economic model. If it is about making money very, very late after having, after having invested, maybe you're right, it's non-conventional. But in in the end, it is. Uh, it's the nature uh, is it's because of the nature of the investor and the investor and the and the shareholders basically, compared to other satellite, traditional satellite operators. I think it's a it's the same economic model with different timelines and, and and very different asset investment from the beginning. I I think it's uh, I don't see a disruption. I think it will change uh, some of the applications we're doing uh, to low latency and and some specific applications, but. Uh, uh, we need to keep in sight that the uh, Leo constellation is approximately three to four times higher in terms of uh, cost compared with the equivalent geo, uh, geo uh, solution, although it does, it does different things. So it's, it is something that requires a different model and different support. 
what I see at the moment is involvement of governments is key. It seems to be key to make things uh, happening uh, mm -hmm. uh, safely, and this is probably the, the solution. I think uh, the, the governments will need uh, so, so this kind of solutions in the future, and will probably help uh, delivering the, the delivering the, the economical model that's behind it. So it's uh, it's still too 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 early to say, but uh, we'll see some developments. And what we have seen in the year 2020 has shown that at least on one web, definitely it has seen, we've seen that. But we'll see for others as well. Anyone on this? Any risk of disruption in the SATCOM ecosystem with these uh, NGSOs if they become fully operational? I wanna... Maybe uh, yeah, Alvin. Uh, Quick comment on that. So, so first, as we said before, uh, those constellations won't serve the full market needs. Uh, some of the needs will uh, will will be covered by geo satellites. So those uh, those market segments will be impacted by uh, by those new constellations. Uh, the second point is that um, it might uh, this new offering might boost uh, the market itself because indeed it's gonna it's gonna provide. Uh, what we were looking for in the, in the SATCOM business, which means, I, I mean, low latency, high throughput, uh, which was missing up to now. Uh, and therefore, uh, what might happen uh, thanks to that is that the, the size of the market uh, will grow. In fact, the size of the SATCOM market will grow. Or in other words, uh, when we compare the size of the SATCOM market as compared to the terrestrial co connectivity market, which is as of today, less than a percent, uh, this market share within the full connectivity market might grow. And if, if we would reach, for example, 2 to 3 percent, it means that the overall connectivity market could be multiplied by more than two or three. Uh, and I think uh, those constellations might stimulate uh, the, uh, the uh, SATCOM connectivity market and, and therefore create a bigger market for us, uh, which will be positive uh, for the uh, overall industry. Mm. Anyone on this, Chris, uh, Dan, for instance, any comment? I, I guess I would I would just say, and I, uh, John Mark hit it, but the, the economic model over time will will be a very large driver of, of what the business cases look like for the customers. And right now, we're seeing an insatiable demand for data, uh, mobile data, uh, data outside the five G networks uh, as those get built out as well. And it, if that continues to be the trend um, and the economic model for the different types of providers, whether they be Geo or Leo or other modalities works well, uh, we'll continue to see strong investment there and, and multiple uh, set of opportunities, I think, for the manufacturers. Hmm. Uh, Chris, Lisa, I'd like to get your view as well on this. Any, do you see risk of disruption or not at all? Do you see that as a complementary yeah, so set of capabilities? Yeah, I certainly see the fact that, you know, growing the overall you know, size of the pie with, with you know, the some of the capabilities that, that Leos are going to bring from a low latency perspective is good for the overall marketplace. Uh, and so I certainly agree there. I, I do think, you know, that our customers and, and we as manufacturers need to continue to innovate and continue to, to push capabilities forward. And and some of the these non-traditional or, or NGSO systems are, are forcing us to, to look at them and understand how they fit in this ecosystem. So overall, if, if we don't continue to innovate and if we don't continue to think about how we tie in those capabilities into the into the ecosystem, sure, there, there could be risk. But I think we're taking the right steps to think about the problem and our customers are thinking about the problem as a added, an addition of capability that then needs to be integrated with the broader system. Um, and, and things like O3B Empower that, you know, a lot of discussion on Leo, but, you know, a lot of capability being added into, into Mio as well. So how do, how do those capabilities work seamlessly with, with Leo, with Geo, and with the terrestrial networks? That to me is a great opportunity. Um, and so it's, you know, shame on us if we can't, can't figure that out and, and grow the overall piece of the pie together. Hmm. I would just comment, I think, yeah, I was going to say, if, if they're successful with these Leo constellations, these mega constellations, you know, they're going to be connecting folks in rural areas and areas that have never been connected before. And I just think that brings huge opportunity to what we can then do and how the demand is going to continue to grow. So I, I think it's going to be complementary because I think there's multiple um, capabilities that will be required here to support the demand, the data man demand that's going to be there. And then with new folks coming into the digital age, if you will, I think uh, new markets and new opportunities will grow. We have a few minutes left. So in the audience, if you have questions, please uh, 
don't hesitate to shoot so that uh, we can uh, uh, reserve some time for for your specific questions i'll continue to uh, to move uh, um on, on the last uh, last questions on my side uh, the um so you have uh, satellite manufacturers continuously innovate uh, innovated over time to offer satellite operators greater capacity and greater flexibility for their missions at lower cost. Um, so where are you going to focus now uh, to increase your value proposition uh, to your customers, whether in terms of uh, uh, technical capabilities, innovations, or in terms of services? Where do you see the, uh, your, your, value, your value proposition as a differentiation factor to your customers? Uh, and maybe Lisa, uh, let's, uh, let's start with you. So I think, um, you know, we've uh, been continuing to invest in technologies that can help provide more flexibility on the satellites themselves, um, the reprogram mobility um, so that they can actually transform the missions that they're doing while they're on orbit. Uh, and then the other areas of investments have really been on the ground side, um, connecting in with um, artificial intelligence and being able to automatically configure those satellites and move beam patterns around and move the communications from satellites to satellites to help support the customers' needs and demands that are there. And then, as I mentioned earlier, as we get more into IoT, um, really trying to integrate into the terrestrial portion of what's going on, where we started to do that already with our satellites that are on orbit today, but then continuing to grow that into the 5G marketplace and integrating with those terrestrial providers. Um, who wants to uh, to uh, to continue on this on this question? How do you uh, uh, increase your value proposition in the future? Services, technical in innovations. What do you see uh, yourself, uh, Jean-Marc? Let's say. <clears throat> uh, yes, I think besides what we, we said on, on flexible satellites, I think the thing where we're investing at the moment that will probably change the way we do business in the future is optical communications. Uh, it's something that we are pushing uh, really strongly in, in Airbus. We are embarking the Teleo Optical Com demonstrator on Arabsat now, which is uh, which will be live demonstration on Arabsat 8. Uh, the EDRS system for Copernicus satellites in Europe is going to be also a breakthrough here. But uh, more than that, I think having having been selected by Lockheed Martin for the SDA transport layer with our optical interstate links is uh, also a sign of uh, of a very lively development of this uh, optical communication between satellites and between satellites and ground ground between geo and Leo, and this will change completely the way we do business it will improve drastically the security of what we do in space because the jamming is really not possible on optical links and it also increased the, the bandwidth of exchange and and we, we see the market going through full communication that be connecting assets uh, airborne assets and space assets together securely in a, in a way forward and that's where we're investing at the moment hmm. um i don't know maybe dan do you, um Beyond the increased productivity on each uh, GBPS purchased by, by your customers, do you see more radical shifts, innovations moving forward? Uh, I do. I think the industry will continue to, to drive uh, for, for speed, a greater bandwidth and power, as well as the flexibility uh, that was mentioned several times here. Um, and, and some of that's going to come in in, in terms of non-traditional manufacturing processes as well. Uh, digitiz digitization of the, the design phase right into the manufacturing phase to be able to to get to market faster for customers. And so I think uh, as we continue to to revamp the industrial base here, that we'll be moving very fast forward with some of our customers on this front. I see an interesting, unusual question on the chat. Uh, are you increasingly integrated, uh, integrating concepts such as eco-design, life cycle assessment, circular, circular economy in the manufacturing of satellites? Satellite eco-design. Uh, I don't know who want to answer that question coming from the audience. Hey, come on, Chris. Can you repeat it? I'm sorry. It uh, yeah. yeah, are you increasing? So there was a question from the audience. Are you increasingly integrating concepts such as eco design, life cycle assessment, circular economy in the manufacturing of satellites? I mean, certainly the the full life cycle costs of of what it takes to to manufacture and and what that means from a replenishment from a business case um, has kind of always been at the at the forefront. I mean, Boeing 
as a company does a lot from a, an eco design and, and ensuring that you know what we're doing is, is sustainable. I think that's the right thing for the planet. I think it's the, the right thing for you know the sustainability of our, our capabilities going forward. So that's that's a focus area. I think it's always been a focus area on understanding life cycle costs and, and what that means to our customers. Anyone else on this? Uh, that might be actually the conclusion uh, conclusion sec uh, question. Hervé, in Thales, life cycle. In Thales, we, we are very much engaged in uh, uh, having more and more eco designs uh, for all our products. So this applies obviously to, uh, uh, to satellites uh, definitively. It's a very strong, uh, let's say, company commitment in that direction. Um, is it something as well that is coming um, from uh, working with uh, startups, new space uh, players, uh, the new generation? You know, are they? Is that something that you are hearing maybe from uh, from the new generation when you are partnering with them, or not at all? Jean-Marc, I don't know, Dan, Lisa, anyone? It's not prominent the way I see today. Uh, we work with. Uh... Okay. With small companies, but it's not the first thing that comes. But uh, I'm with my colleagues here. We, we, it's it's a trend that is happening in the industry, not only in space, also in aeronautics. And we have a very strong program on this on, on CO2 uh, uh, compatible uh, developments in the future, and also concern what we do here. But it's not the first okay. thing that comes from the partners. But, but maybe what I comment see. here is this is this is also something uh, we we hear from our uh, employees in fact and and the youngest employees are extremely concerned about those topics uh, and i think uh, if we want to employ the best talents today uh, i think it's important that as companies uh, we, we we comply with this kind of requirements uh, because um, i think it's becoming more more and more a kind of prerequisite if we want to really attract some of the best uh, des best talents coming from the uh, engineering schools. Okay. Well, I think that would be uh, uh, the the word for closing of our um, the last words closing our our session. Um, uh, I've got message that it's time now to close and to move on um, with the uh, with the conclusions of the day uh, with uh, with Lorraine. Um, so I would like to thank you very much uh, the five of you for having been uh, with us. Uh, hopefully next time we see you in Paris and we take some time to actually uh, see us uh, see uh, see uh, together and, and discuss uh, on stage in Paris. Uh, um, but otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you very much in the audience uh, for uh, your questions, uh, for your answers uh, as well, and your participation. Uh, I think you now it's time to uh, add up to uh, Lorraine for the conclusion of uh, this uh, first day for, uh, for the Satellite Business Week. Uh, thank you very much and uh, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thanks.